This sermon is titled Understanding God's Timings. Be enriched as you listen. Over the last few Sundays, we've been talking about following Jesus in prayer. And we've been observing the life, the teachings, the myth. And the ministry of the Lord Jesus on the subject of prayer, uh, we've tried to draw lessons and insights that we could put into our own lives, that we could practice in our own lives. I want us to continue on the same journey of looking at the Lord Jesus, but I want us to focus today and observe from his life and draw some lessons on how the Lord Jesus walked in step and in time with the Father. So I want to to talk to us about understanding God's timings. Because when Jesus walked on the earth, he just didn't live life haphazardly. And as we will see in the scriptures, he journeyed through life, according to the Father's timings for his life. It's very important. And so I want us to focus on that and then draw some lessons, things that we can apply to our own lives. Now, the Bible does tell us the the very fact uh, that, that the very birth of Jesus took place in the fullness of time. We know that, Galatians 4, 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. He sent Jesus into the world. So even his birth was timed by God. There was a timing to his birth. But then as we observe how he went about his life, there are uh, insights and observe especially how did he walk in time with God and what lessons can we take? I just want to bring some of those insights to us this morning. Now, I'll just put them in uh, phrases or sentences that, that we could probably relate to. The first one I want to bring attention to is that we observe Jesus exercising restraint until the Father's timing. To begin his ministry. Now that was 30 long years. 30 long years. Now we are all familiar with John chapter 2 and verse 4. Where Jesus was with his mother and disciples. He was at the wedding of Cana. And they ran out of wine. And you know, his mother tells him in John 2, 4. Uh, John chapter 2 says, you know, they're, they're out of wine. And then he answers in John chapter 2 verse 4. He says... You know, what do I have to do with this? My hour, my time has not yet come. That means the time to, for me to begin to do these miracles, these mighty things, has not yet come. My time, or my hour has not yet come. Now try to imagine this in your mind. This is the Son of God, the eternal God who has become Man is walking on the earth as the son of God. I mean, he's waiting to get started. He's waiting to do those mighty things. He's waiting to cast out demons. He's waiting to work miracles. He knows he's called for these great things. And yet, he has to be satisfied. Just working as a carpenter next to his father. You can imagine And he's just known as a common man. The same one who is God in flesh, who is eternal. The the God who's become man is the son of God. And he just has to be satisfied being known as a carpenter, a commoner. That's it. But he's called for greatness. He's called to do great things. He's called to be the savior of the world. He's called to do those mighty miracles. And yet for 30 years, he just has to be satisfied. Doing the ordinary. Now, looking at it, 
in a, in a broad sense, there were theological reasons. They were, there could be cultural reasons as to why Jesus waited 30 years. If you look at it from a theological perspective, the Old Testament teaches that the Levites who served in the temple, they had to be 30 years of age before they could start engaging. And some of the important events in the lives of the patriarchs, like Joseph, he was 30 years before he was elevated to serve under Potiphar. David was 30 years before he was elevated to be king. So looking at it from a theological perspective, maybe that was one reason why Jesus just waited 30 years. There could have been cultural reasons in those times. Uh, the Jews considered a young man of the age of, who had reached 30 years. He was then qualified to be called a rabbi, a teacher. And so Jesus did what was culturally acceptable. Okay, wait till you're 30 and then start. Then he's recognized as a rabbi. And that was how he was referred to. He was called as a rabbi, a teacher. So culturally, there could have been some reasons. But the most important reason, Jesus said, John 2 verse 4, my time has not yet come. He's waiting for the Father's timing. Think about that. So you and I must learn. God may have called us to do certain things in life. But wait for the Father's timing. There's a restraint. Yes, it is there in your future. But wait for the Father's timing. In John chapter 7, verse 6, 7, 8, there's a very simple incident, which is the family is going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a very simple thing. And yet, even in something so simple, Jesus is being sensitive to the Father's timing. In John chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, 6 and, six and 8, he tells them, he says, You go ahead because my time has not yet come. You go. You go to the feast. I'll come later. Now, this is a very simple thing. They say, hey, why do you make such a big deal? It's just a festival. <laughs> We're just going to the feast of the tabernacle because everybody's coming. Come along. Yeah, it seems very simple. And yet, even in the simple, ordinary thing of going to Jerusalem for a feast, Jesus is being sensitive to something within him that says, you stay. Go later. And so he's telling his family, you all go ahead. My time has not yet come. For what? To go to the feast. Very simple. But yet it bears for us the importance Jesus gave to be attentive to the Father's timings for his life. Another thing we see in the life and the ministry of Jesus, and I would just put it like this, the, his confidence, how confident he was Knowing the Father's timing, confident in life because of God's timing. John chapters 7 and 8 are very interesting. Because in these two chapters, we see Jesus do two opposing things twice. In chapter 7 and 8, two times you read, Jesus hid himself. He did not come out openly. Why? Because the people were waiting to kill him. So he protected himself. You know, he didn't go out and say, hey, the Bible says, you know, no evil shall befall me, no weapon shall, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Come on, guys, let me see what you can do. No, no. He wasn't reckless. The Bible says he hid himself. Okay, something to think about. Sometimes some of us are so spiritual, we are stupid. <laughs> Sorry to put it so bluntly, okay? <laughs> but it's like, hey, look at Jesus. If there was anybody who could be divinely protected was Jesus, and yet Jesus hid himself. He did not show himself openly because he knew they were out to kill him. 
That means he lived life prudently. He lived life taking precautions. Are you with me? But another interesting thing, in the same two chapters, on two occasions, you find something different stated. That is, in the temple, he came out boldly and preached, and nobody could harm him because his time had not yet come. So it's almost opposing ideas in the same two chapters. Twice he hides himself, does not go out openly, but on two occasions he goes out boldly into the temple and he preaches and he teaches them. And the reason nobody could harm him is his time had not yet come. See that John chapter 7 and verse 30. No one laid hands on him. His hour had not yet come. John 8 verse 20. He was teaching. He spoke in the treasury. He taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. So when it came to doing something that the father wanted him to do, which is teach and minister, he could do it with absolute confidence. He can do it with complete boldness, knowing that nobody could harm him. Because the time has not yet come. But under normal circumstances, you take precaution. Are you understanding? So there's a lesson here. That when you and I are walking in step and in time with God, and you know that God's appointed time has come for you to do something He wants you to do. He wants you to do. You can step out boldly and do it with almost a sense of audacity because you know that God is for you and no man, no devil can stop you. Because you're in step and in time with God. Are you listening? Whatever God's called you to do in life, when you step out in time with God, there's a sense of holy boldness. You know that nothing can stop you because you are right there where God wants you to be and you are almost invincible. You are in a place of security when you're in the center of what God wants you to be doing in step, in time. A place of complete immunity. Divinely protected. And you can have that holy boldness and confidence to do it because you're following God. Are you listening? So we must learn to walk in step in time with God in that fashion. A third observation we can make when we look at Jesus is that Jesus recognized when the time had come to do something the father wanted, he recognized the time. And he readied himself to do it. He recognized the time has come. And this is especially true when, when it was time for him to go to the cross. And I'll point us to some scriptures here in John 12, 23. Jesus says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I mean, time's come. It's come. It's here. This is what I have to do now. John 12, 27. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. He is recognizing that the purpose and the time has now come together. There's an intersection. This purpose, this hour, that's why I came. My assignment and my time. The time for my assignment has come. It's there. I've got to ready myself. I've got to step into it. For this purpose, for this time, it's coming together. I have to step in. John 13, 1. Before the fe feast of the Passover, and Jesus knew, Jesus knew. That his hour had come. So he recognized that time has come. John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that 
your son also may glorify you, knowing when the time has come. It's so important. The purpose, the time. It's come. I got to step in. Recognizing it is so important. And Jesus knew the time had come. The last observation that I just want to present to us in the life of Jesus is he also lived with a sense of foresight, looking ahead, foreseeing what lies ahead, what is coming, the time the time is coming. That means there are things out in the future. Examples. John 4, 21, 23. He said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming. The time is coming. That's in the, out in the future. And people are going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Verse 23, the hour is coming. It's already come. It's right here now. You've got to worship the Father in spirit and truth. It's not about which mountain you go to. There's a change in the way you worship. You don't go to Sinai. You don't go to Zion. You go, you worship in spirit and truth. Another thing, John 5, 25 and 28, he said, The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of God. Verse 28, don't marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. John 16, verse 2. He's telling his disciples, guys, sorry, this is APC paraphrase. <laughs> sorry. He said, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. So he's saying, time is coming. He said, look, look, look. It's not, not all about the fish and the loaves. This is not a free lunch plan. Did you come with me? No, no. The time is coming. They're going to come after you. They're going to come to kill you. That's what's coming up. The time is coming. Things are going to change. John 16, 4. But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember I told you of them. So he's talking to them now in order to prepare them for the future. And John 16, 25, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you like this. You will understand things plainly. I mean, if you look at all of these scriptures, and I know I've, I've gone to them very quickly, but you can imagine Jesus is talking to his disciples, but he's preparing them for things to come. He says, look, you're going to worship differently. You're going to worship in spirit and truth. There's going to be a resurrection. Better be ready for that. And in the future, people are going to come after you. They're going to attack you. You better be ready for that. I'm telling you things now. You don't understand it right now. But there will come a time when you will understand it. The point is that Jesus was living in the present with an eye on the future. Are you with me? He was preparing his disciples for what was to come, getting them ready for the future. Even they may, not have, they may not have understood it, but he's saying, I need to get you ready for what's coming up. The question is, do you and I live like that? Are you and I able to exercise restraint in what we are doing? Or is it, God, I want it now, and I want it right now. Or are you and I able to say, God, I know you have this for me, but I want it in the right time. And at the, till, the, till that time, I am satisfied being a common. I'm satisfied doing my mundane work. Some of us may be called to greatness. We may be called to do great things, big things, things around the world. But right now, you have to be in Bengaluru whether you like it or not. And you've got to be doing something ordinary, whether you like it or not. Can you exercise restraint? 
Or are you grumbling, complaining, finding fault with everybody else? Because of them, I'm not going there. No, no, no. There's a timing. There's a father's timing. Are you listening? And then when you know that the time has come for you to do something, are you able to step out boldly knowing that that's what, that's the purpose, there's the confluence of time and purpose. It's come together and that moment you can step out and do it with boldness knowing that nothing can shake you because you are in the right place doing the right thing. No man, no devil can stop you. Do you have that confidence? And we should as believers. Move like that. When we know God, the timing for our assignment has come, do we ready ourselves mentally, emotionally, prepare ourselves and say, okay, now I'm ready to step in. I have to step in. The time has come. God help me get ready for it. And can we look ahead in the future and take preparatory action right now to ready ourselves for what we know is to come? That we're not just letting life happen to us, but we are preparing for what is yet to come. Are you listening? Now let's look at some other scriptures. The Bible teaches us that our times are in His hands. Psalm 31, verse 15. Let's all say this together, like, with, like the psalmist said, put your hands in front of you. Say, my times are in his hands. My times are in his hands. That's what the psalmist said. My times, the when, the appointed time, the fullness of time, your times are in God's hands. Amen? That's the safest place. Thank God it's there. That's the best place to have my appointed times, your appointed times, in the hands of God. My times are in his hands. So no matter what I face on earth, like the psalmist at that time was facing physical enemies, but he knew something. Enemy, you can't knock me out. My time is in his hands. Amen? Amen? My time is in his hands. But yet, there is a responsibility on us. And what is that responsibility? That's what I want to bear on our hearts. Living responsibly. Yes, our times are in the hands of God. He's got the appointed times. He's got the times for things that he wants to make happen in our lives. But we have to be sensitive to the Father's timings for our lives. You got to live like Jesus in time and in step with God for our lives. Daniel chapter 2, verses 21, 22, Daniel writes, he says, He changes times and seasons. So what does God do? Our times are in his hands and he says, hello, I'm going to change the time and the season of your life. Now you can understand it personally at a personal level. You can understand it in the setting of a community, a church, a nation, or global. I mean, in, in all sense, God changes times and seasons. Now, think about it in the natural. And, and you know, I, I understand that in India, uh, our, our change in seasons isn't very significant, not very drastic. Maybe in some parts it is. But just imagine, if you go through the winter, we are all wearing, you know, warm clothing, sweaters, all that, and the season changes, it's summer. And if we still keep wearing those layers of sweaters that are in summer, People would think something's wrong. What do we do? We adapt when seasons change. How you live changes when seasons change. And that must be true even in our walk with God. 
Your times are in his hands and he changes times and seasons. And when he's changing the season of your life, it's, it's, it's important for you and me to adapt to that change in season. However he wants, whatever the changes are that he wants us to make in the way we live our lives. Adapt to the new season that God is bringing on your life. If we continue to live the old way according to the old season, we're going to get into trouble. God, it's too hard. Yeah, I changed the season. Change your clothing. God, it's not comfortable. God, you're doing something wrong. No, 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 no. I've changed the season. You change the way you are living. You can't live like you were in the previous season. This is a new season. And so it's important for us, so important for us to recognize when God is changing the time and the season of our lives. And he's saying, look, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to orchestrate something different for you. There's a new season coming on your life. Now, will you adapt to this new season? You're going to do things differently. Because he changes times and seasons for our lives, for your life. Changing. And You know, God is not a mean God. He says, hello, I changed the season of your life. Go figure out what I did now. It's not like that. Verse 22 says, he reveals deep and secret things. That means he's changing the times and seasons, but he's revealing that to us. He knows what's in darkness and the light dwells with him. That means he will give you and me light. He's not going to keep us in darkness. He changes the times and seasons, and then he reveals that to us. But the question is, are you and I listening? Amen? God be listening to God. Okay. This is the time. This season. Many of us are familiar with uh, what Solomon wrote, King Solomon, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I look at, we look at verse 10 and 11. He says, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. So each one of us are occupied with a God-given task or tasks. Things that God has given you to do. For each one of us, it's different. We are all in different stages of life. We are all occupied with different God-given things, tasks. So what is your God-given task right now? What is your God-given task with which you are occupied? God's given it to you. You're doing it well and good. But there's something you need to know about your God-given tasks. Next verse, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. So God gives you your God-given task to be occupied with. And you want to become the CEO tomorrow. You're just the entry-level person. He makes all things beautiful in it. Just stay with your task. Keep doing it. It's your God-given task that he wants you to be occupied with. Do it. Do it well. Put your heart and soul into it. Keep learning. And as you're doing it, he makes all things beautiful in its time. He'll make it good. He'll bring it to its fullness. He will bring it to its, its complete sense and picture. And he's given you the task to do it. You be occupied with it. He will bring it to its place of beauty, its place of maturity, its place of completion. He will bring it. And that verse continues, God has put eternity in our hearts. There is that understanding about the sense of God in all of our hearts. But it is true that we cannot understand all of God's ways. And God is not expecting us to understand all of his ways. You and I just... Be occupied with a task he's given you, knowing that the God-given task will be brought to its beauty in its time. That's it. Don't try to understand everything about God. He says we can't understand everything about God. 
We have a sense of eternity in our hearts, but we're not going to figure God out. It's too big. Just rest in the fact that he makes all things beautiful. In it, he'll do it. Just rest in that. And King Solomon continues in that book of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. He says, look, here's the key. A wise man, a wise man, a wise man's heart discerns time and judgment. That means time and purpose. The right time to do something and the right thing to do. That's what a wise man is trying to understand. Time and purpose. What's the right thing to do and the right time to do it? A wise man's heart discerns time and purpose. Because, or six, because for every matter there is a time and there is judgment. That means for everything we have to do, there's a right time to do it and there's a right thing to do. And you and I have to be wise to discern time and purpose. Are you with me? So that's our pursuit. God, help me to understand when I should do this and what exactly I should do. Time and purpose. I know it's there in my life. I know it's part of your plan. I know it's, it's there in the future. But the question is, when should I do it and how should I do it? What is the right way to go about it? Time and purpose. A wise man's heart discerns, understands. He's, he's after this. He's trying to understand. This is his pursuit. He's trying to understand time and purpose. And so you and I should pray like the psalmist in Psalm 90. The psalmist said, let's read it together. Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days. That we may gain a heart of Now, you see, when you read this, especially from the King James, it seems like the psalmist is standing in front of a calendar and saying, check one day closer to the grave. Check one more day closer to the grave. Teach us to number a... That's not what he's saying. That's not the point. Oh, I'm getting closer to the grave. That's not the point. The point is, God, help me to understand the timings of my life. Give me a heart of wisdom to understand the time of my life. Teach me to number my days. Teach me to understand the timing of my life so that I can have a heart of wisdom to understand these things. Are you with me? He's not counting his days. Well, I'm getting closer to the grave. That's not the point. Help me to understand the timing. And that should be our prayer. God, help me to understand time and season for my life. What, are you, what do I do? What do you want me to do in this season? Help me to journey with this. In step with you, in time with you. For all of us, God has what we refer to as God-given tasks to be occupied with. And, and, and these are tasks that are connected to the times and seasons of our life. There's a time and season when you have to study. That's not the time to worry about marriage. It'll come. It's in your future. Right now you're in 12th grade. Don't fret yourself about it. Relax. Whom am I going to get married? It will come. There is a time and a season. Right now, your God-given task, study. Be occupied with it. I know, I'm just, you know, but the point, you get the point. Then you journey into another season of your life. Maybe you graduate, now you're starting your work, your career, your God-given task. Do well. Give it your best. Whatever you're doing, be occupied with it. Oh, when will I buy the house? When will I buy the car? And the third car and the fourth car? Time will come. Don't worry about those things now. You're just getting your career started, make sure you do your job well. 
Don't fret yourself about things ahead of your time. I mean, yes, you can have foresight. You can say that at some point in my life, I want to buy a house. I want to make sure I buy a car. Uh, of, okay. Be occupied with your God-given task in this season. Do it well. Understand the time and season of your life. Live in step and in time with God. In First Chronicles, we close with this. First Chronicles 12, verse 32. Um, we read about the sons of Issachar, a particular tribe. They had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So they understood the times. They knew what was the right course of action. What should an entire nation be doing? Think about it. They understood the times. This is what we should be doing, therefore. To be like that, like one of the sons of Issachar, who has understanding of the times. So in your life and our lives, each for each of us, I really want to encourage us, like what we saw in the life of Jesus, that he was so perceptive, he was so sensitive, and he was so obedient to the Father's timings for his life. And you and I, should be in that same place, in the same posture, saying, God, I want to walk in step and in time with you. God, show me what you want me to be doing in this season of life. And the Lord will do that. And when you are stepping out in time, in step with Him, you can be absolutely bold. You know that God is going to back you up 100% in doing what you're called to do. Amen? Now, just to kind of make this little relatable, I'll tell you a few stories, and then we will uh, wrap. And I'm not just saying theory, but I can rem remember way back in the early days of my life when I went to college in Manipal after my, my 12th grade here in B Bangalore, went to Manipal. That was 1986 to 1990. Some of you were not around those days. Okay. <laughs> but... When I was in college, when I went to Manipal, I knew that God had called me to start a work in this place, a minister. I, I went to study, do my engineering, but I said, God, I have to start a work. And in those days in Manipal, we had a few traditional churches. Uh, there was no spiritual church at that time over there. And uh, I said, God, I know, I know I have to start a work in this place, but how do I do it? When do you want me to do it? I started praying. I was full of zeal, eager to do it. But my prayer was, God, show me when, show me how. And I remember in January of 1989, we had come home for Christmas holiday, Christmas break, January, getting ready to go back to campus. And I was praying here in my home. I just felt in my spirit, when you go back, Rent the hall in Hotel Valley View. I think it's still there. And start the work. Now, Gabriel did not come. He was busy doing more important things. <laughs> God just put it in my heart. And that's the way God speaks. He puts it into your heart. So don't look for Gabriel. Don't look for some handwriting on your wall. Say, God, that's a pink wall. I like your handwriting. Write something there. No. God speaks to you in your hearts. He puts it there. The Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. That's it. So I just knew. It happened in an instant. Something dropped in my spirit. It's time to, when you go back, do this. So I went back to Manipal. Went to the hotel. I said, I want to rent this seminar hall every Saturday. Please book it in my name. We're going to start. And I told them what we're going to do. Christian meeting right here. In those days, we called it Believer's Fellowship. Later on, they renamed it to Manipal Believer's Fellowship. We're going to start. Did I have the money? No. Did I have everything? No. But I knew in my spirit that time had come. And we started. And the rest is just a wonderful journey where... Several hundreds of students, both medical college, engineering college, everyone. So many lives were impacted over the years. 
when I went to the U.S. to do my master's, I knew in my spirit that I was going to come back to Bangalore to serve God. One of the things was to plant a church that will impact the nation. I knew. Now, in my mind, I thought, okay, I'll go for two years, then come back. But my main prayer was, God, you tell me when I should go back. My prayer is, I just want to be ready to go back. Meaning, I want to be fully equipped so that when I'm coming back, I come back with value. I bring some learning, some equipping, so I can have impact for your kingdom. That was my prayer. I just want to be fully equipped. And right from the beginning, from 1990, that was my prayer. God, I want to be equipped. I'll go back anytime you say. I just want to know when I should do it. And we should travel those days, just come, preach, and go back, short trips. But I remember in 1998, came one of those trips ministering in North India. In that trip, I fell in my heart. It's time to move back. Once again, Gabriel was busy with other things. No angel came. It was just in my spirit. So the point I want to, you know, put on, put on us is, hey, God is speaking to you in your spirit. He's telling you about his times, his seasons. He's telling you. It's not like God is keeping quiet. He's speaking. But it's in your spirit because the Holy Spirit bears witness in your spirit, in your heart. Speaking. I just felt him. So I went back, went to the U.S. I told Amy, you know, I just feel it's time for us to go back and let's get ready. So we gave ourselves time and we moved back and then started the church. But when we started, there was no doubt, am I supposed to be doing this or not? No doubt. God, we are in this 100%. To the point where I said, God, if I spend the rest of my life serving a church of 50 people, I will do it. I'm not going back. That's my commitment. No doubt. If I spend the rest of my life serving 50 people in Bangalore City, done. I'll stay. Because I know that's what God wanted me to do at that time. Amen? And so like this, I can... Just tell you at different points, when we, when we started things, when we did things, in step, in time with God. How? You know in your spirit. The time has come. We got to do this. Got to do this. So I want to challenge each of us in your life. Oh, one more story. So, 1993. I just knew in the spirit, this is the year, the golden year. I'm going to find the person I'm going to get married to. 1993. So in May of 1993, I wrote it down in my notebook. This year, God, I want to find the person I'm going to get married to. And that year, November, is when Amy and I you know, really connected on, 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 on this in a very serious way. How do I know it? Spirit, timing, God's timing. Amen? So, various things in life, various things. You listen to God because your times are in His hands. And He changes times and seasons. And He reveals them to us. He doesn't keep us in the dark. And from our side, we pray, oh God, teach us. Give us, help us to know the times and the seasons that give us a heart of wisdom that we can discern time and season so that we can take the right step at the right time and walk with God. Amen? For each of us, worship team, please come. For each of us, like we read, there, is, there are God-given tasks that He wants all of us to be occupied with. Whatever. God has something for all of us. And He will make each of those things beautiful in their time. He'll do it. That's His commitment. 
Say, look, I'll make this really good and beautiful in your life. I'll do it. God is doing it. But our responsibility is to discern time and season. Time and purpose. And walk with God step by step. Don't get ahead of Him. Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9. God says, I will lead you and I will teach you. In the way you should go, I will guide you with my eye. But don't be like the horse or like the donkey. The horse always wants to run ahead. The donkey doesn't want to move. Don't be like the horse. Don't be like the donkey. In other words, God will lead you and teach you in the way that I, you should go. But you, you and I learn to walk in step and in time with God. Amen? So that's what I want us to just take some time to pray. Think about And today, as we, as we take these last few moments just to worship, say, God, open my heart to discern time and purpose. I want to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. And in this season of my life, wherever you are, some of you may be in college, some of you may be, you know, in, in the workplace, somewhere along in your professional journey, some of you may be in a completely different stage of life, but whatever stage of your life you're in, God has something for you. Just say, God, help me to understand what you want me to do these days of my life. Give me a heart of wisdom. Give me a heart of wisdom. Let's rise to our feet, please. Father, we thank you that your eye is on every person in this auditorium, every person watching online, God. You, your eye is on every individual. And your word says you will teach us. You will lead us in the way we should go. You will guide us with your watchful eye. But Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Grant to each of us a heart of wisdom, God. That we might discern time and purpose. That we might be able to understand the God-given tasks that you want us to be occupied with, Father. In each season of life. And Father, may each of us with that understanding pursue what you want us to pursue in the season. That we will not be out of season, out of step, out of time. But God, we will walk in step and in time with you. That we'll be faithful, God, in what you've given us to do. Knowing that you make all things beautiful. And it's time. You do it. In his time.
what you say in your time, in his time, and in his time, in his time. Father, we just pray that your wisdom, that a recognition of your timings will dawn upon every heart, a recognition of your time and your purpose, so that each one of us, God, will walk with you in step and in time with you. We'll not run ahead of you, not just stay behind you, left behind, but we will walk with you as Jesus walked. Help each of us. as you may need to pray just take a few moments to pray and say God I I want to come into alignment with your timing for my life I don't want to rush I don't want to run ahead I want to be right where you are aligned 
in sync, in sync with you, in step with you. Help me to recognize what I should be doing and help me to do it. I'm not worried about the future. I mean, yes, we have an eye on the future, but we're not worried because He makes it beautiful in its time. He'll make it beautiful. That's His commitment to you. He'll make it beautiful. sing that song one more time and just just wait upon the Lord just wait and just whatever is on your heart just bear it before him let's please sing it in his time in his time make two announcements one we have a book available it's called a time for every purpose if you're interested in just exploring this subject a little bit more you're welcome to take a free copy of that book on your way out or you can also download the PDF online study this a little bit more next Sunday we will be meeting at Baldwin's Wings Auditorium just one more Sunday we have to go there and then we'll be back in this auditorium going forward. So just please remember that. Let's close our prayer. Let's see the benediction. Father, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.